This we conference will now be recorded. Okay. You ready? I'm ready whenever you are, Phil. All righty. Good afternoon. I am Bill Rushalelli, class of 1968 and president of the Wheeling University 50 Year Club. Welcome everyone to Wheeling University and the Appalachian Institute's third in a four part lecture series discussing this land is home to me, the pastoral letter on tirelessness in Appalachia. The letter authored by the Catholic bishops and the people of the region was promulgated at Wheeling University on February 1st, 1975. This third lecture entitled Jubilee Time, 50 Years of Growing, reflects on a precursor to the pastoral letters, the Catholic Committee of Appalachia, then and now, 50 years later. Excuse my bells in the background. <laughs> Following Father Rich's presentation, Robbie D'Andrade, class of 72, along with Michael Ifrat, class of 99 and 03 will respond following the presentations and responses we will open our mics or you can write your questions or comments in the chat box but please mute yourself during the presentations to avoid this background noise also to ensure a better presentation you can go to top to the top of your computer screen and at active camera, click on who's talking, which allows you to see and hear the individual presenter. We wish to thank Wheeling University, President Jenny Fafid, Fathers McCouch, Sasmita, and O'Donnell, Ed Shahady, Dan Haller, and Robbie D'Andrade, and Michael Ifright, and our technology experts, Jared and Alicia, for making this lecture series possible. It further gives us an opportunity to visit with the Jesuit priests who support our Wheeling University students. Father McCouch, will you please begin our discussion with a prayer? Thank you, Phil. I'm going to start by quoting uh, the book of Leviticus with an inscription that's on the Liberty Bell in Philadelphia. Proclaim liberty throughout the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. That was the announcement of Jubilee in the Hebrew scripture, and it grounds our prayer today. It grounds our prayer today because here in this season of creation in the year 2020, uh, Christians around the world are celebrating a Jubilee time. That means it's a special year for universal pardon, a time when slaves would be set free, when prisoners would be freed, when all debts would be forgiven, and when we would uh, ask that we would experience the mercy of God in a special way. So let us pray. God, our creator, our redeemer, our inspiration, we pray today for those living in need in this time of pandemic of COVID-19, for those living broken lives and for why life matters. We pray for your healing, for your wholeness, we pray for an end to broken systems here in Appalachia, throughout our lands and seas, and across our planet. We pray as in a jubilee time for the earth, when many are burdened by debt, pollution, poverty, and human trafficking. We pray for systems that could be whole, for right relationships among people and governments, between people and people, between people and God. With your love, Lord, help us to make whole what is shattered, to witness in whatever you may call among us, and heal our word, our world, and our hearts. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Amen. As director of Appalachian Institute, Father Rich McCout provides continued Jesuit provincial connectivity to the Wheeling Charleston Diocese and Wheeling University. It is in this area of expertise he helps us understand this much heralded pastoral letter and its spiritual and social value for Appalachia's poor for almost 50 years. Father McCouch. Thank you, Phil. I'd like to, as we begin, 
uh, try and explain why we're focusing on Jubilee right now. The Catholic Committee of Appalachia, which was responsible for getting the ball rolling in a sense of coordinating the bishops uh, in authoring that pastoral letter 45 years ago, uh, has a lot to do with the work of the Catholic Committee of uh, Appalachia. But what I, what I want to uh, point out is that what they were doing was not just something that sprang out of nowhere. If we think about our last presentation and we understand how uh, historical events are connected, we know Father that- McCouch, Father yeah. McCouch, yes. can, I, can I interrupt you a second? I see that the president's online here and I know she's a very busy lady, so maybe we can have her make some comments uh, uh, right now and then we can continue with your presentation if that's okay, all right? It's okay with me. I, I don't know if she's actually online. Yeah, she, I see her there. And oh, I see her mic's yeah. open, so. Okay, then. I'm going to bring down to, to check on him. I, I, I sincerely apologize. Um, unfortunately, we, we've had um, a bit of an incident here this morning. Um, we, um, it's, it's wonderful to see all of you. I, I apologize. We had, a, we had a student that tested positive. Um, uh, I'm also having uh, the roof done this week, so I apologize in advance for the noise. Um, but we, um, unfortunately, we're, we're having to take some very swift action to, to um, ensure the safety of the students, um, as well as the entire facility um, for the school. So I apologize for not being here when you all got started. Um, simultaneously, I'm also on a Zoom meeting. Um, as of next week, the state is asking us to begin random testing of 10% of our population on a weekly basis. Um, that will be completely paid for by the university. But um, as, as we continue to go through what is COVID, uh, it is, you know, it is a constant and everyday challenge. But um, and I think that's one of the times where I'm so grateful that we have these types of things going on, um, that Father Conroy, Father McCouch, and Father Hottie are, are a part of our everyday lives. Um, you know, I, I, I have shared with you, I, I see them almost daily. They were with us um, last night at our town hall. I'm going to be with them this evening. Um, they continue to be a part of, of our everyday life. And, and I know for all of you alumni, that is important. It's important for you to know um, that, you know, we are still Ignatian in the way that, you know, we go about our daily um, business here. And, and I assure you of that because they are always um, with us. Um, so I thank you for taking the time to gather today. Um, Michael. <laughs> Sorry, I, I appreciate your involvement. Um, it's nice to see you involved. I know that you're, you're um, extraordinarily knowledgeable in, in this particular um, venue. I actually took the liberty of actually reading the pastoral letters and it's amazing how relevant that information is today. Um, the value of, of what it represents for the Appalachian area in general is still the, the focus. It needs to be the focus of what we do here, uh, it's, it's really, uh, both uh, academically as well as our community service. So this this um, this moment in time is poignant. Uh, the last thing I'll share, and then I'll let Father McHouch um, proceed, is that as we move forward with our strategic plan, this this is a part of our plan. It's a vital part of our plan. It is part of our our, our founding principles, our founding mission. Um, so this work remains vital. So as always, I appreciate the 50-year club, Dr. Shahedi, um, your you know your initiative to get this started, um, utilizing this this new uh, virtual uh, presence that we have, um, and and I appreciate you all taking the time to be with us today, Father. Um, I, I certainly didn't mean to interrupt you. I appreciate it, but please proceed. Thank you so much, Jimmy. So we're, we're talking about Jubilee and, and what that means. Uh, a Jubilee is something that occurs every 50 years, and of course the 50-year club is celebrating Jubilee every year. We're always celebrating someone's 50th anniversary. The Catholic Committee of Appalachia is set at celebrating its 50th anniversary this year also, and we're focusing today in a special way on how what they did 50 years ago to get this pastoral letter uh, in place uh, was very important. 
But I want to mention that uh, something very important about Jubilee. It's not just about this particular year. It's about looking back over the past 50 years and expressing great gratitude to God and to our neighbor for everything that has been accomplished. So we might be very focused on what's going on in the year 2020, but we talk about this letter that was written in the 1970s. And of course, what was written in the 1970s could not have happened without uh, the work that was done in the 1930s, in the 1890s, in the 1840s, in the 1780s. So at each Jubilee time, there is something growing and we're focusing on that today. I'd like to talk about the origins of the Catholic Committee of Appalachia. In the beginning, it was an arm of, or functioned as an arm of, the Commission on Religion in Appalachia, uh, which was founded in 1965, right after the, uh, the ARC uh, Commission, the Appalachian Regional Commission. In that Commission on Religion in Appalachia, there were 18 denominations involved, which included, of course, the Roman Catholics and Bishop Hodges, the Bishop of Wheeling Charleston Diocese at the time, was our founder in that group. Now, in 1970, there was an arm of that commission started, which became the Catholic Committee of Appalachia. When they were at uh, one of their annual meetings in 1973, there were eight gentlemen uh, present uh, up at Bethany College, and they were to meet with some representatives of some of the energy companies in the area. But when it came to the actual meeting time, the only people who showed up to represent the companies were uh, press secretaries, and that made the committee uh, a bit annoyed. So they adjourned to a coffee shop, they talked over what they could do, and that's where the incipient ideas for the pastoral letter came from. The idea was that they would send out people across Appalachia to 30 different locations, and they would listen to the people. And then they would take the voice of the people and try to bring it into focus in a letter that the bishops of Appalachia, 26 bishops, would get together and uh, promulgate together, and then the third part of uh, that would, would, would have been an, an action plan. Now, I'd like to focus on one word that, that comes up in all of this, and that is solastalgia. We understand what neuralgia is, right? A, a pain in the head, a headache. Uh, we understand what nostalgia is when you leave your home and then come back and you find things are different. Solastalgia is a term that, that speaks about when you see your home changing right before your eyes and it causes great pain. And this is one of the uh, ideas that, or one of the concepts that pushed forward uh, the uh, pastoral letters, that there was great pain being felt among all the people of the region because of some of the changes taking place because of how resources uh, were being uh, stripped from Appalachia and how in the process, the dignity of the people was also being stripped away. So the Catholic Committee of Appalachia has been working uh, for these past 50 years then, working on uh, developing not only these pastoral letters, but trying to organize in such a way that the voices of the people will be heard. Now, of course, in all of that time, there is uh, going to be a lot of organizational work. There's going to be some frustrations with organizational work. Uh, and uh, the action plans that are put down on paper do not necessarily translate into live action plans. What the Catholic Committee of Appalachia decided to do subsequent to the release of the uh, first pastoral letter, and in this way I would like to bring it up to date, they wanted to ask the question, what is it like to be you 
in this place? What is it like to be you in Appalachia? Now, I'd like to make a distinction between the tone of the original pastoral letter 45 years ago and the third pastoral letter five years ago. In This Land is Home to Me, the, the central uh, idea there was that Appalachia is not a simple place. It was a place where, according to their definition, in this region are, and I quote, mountain folk, city folk, country folk, coal miners and steel workers, union workers, non-union workers, industrial workers, service workers, farmers, farm laborers, housewives and children, teachers and health workers, ministers and rabbis and priests, artists and poets, professionals and technicians, lawyers and politicians, lobbyists and interest groups, executives and man managers, little business people, big business people, coal companies, chemical companies, industrialists, and bankers. With that sense that Appalachia is not a simple place, trying to balance the voices of all those people they realized in that first letter would not be uh, easy. In the course of the 40 years that followed before the third pastoral letter then, they had to come to grips with who the audience was, who the authors would be, what changed over two generations. And in fact, We've had to undergo many conversations, even in terms of what it means to be a Catholic today. This is not just a philosophical question. Today, for example, and in this very week, we expect an announcement from the president as to who his announcement as to who his nominee might be for the Supreme Court. If that nominee that people suppose is going to be put forward is confirmed, it would mean that there would be seven Catholics on the Supreme Court. That's very different from the situation back in the 1960s and the 1970s. So what we, what we mean by the Catholic Committee of Appalachia is very important to our discussion and why we want to bring up to date what the Catholic Committee of Appalachia is doing and of course, this involves what the nature of communication is today also. I'll give an example. In the original pastoral letter, This Land is Home to Me, they spoke about certain terms, how uh, they were defining the place and how they were defining the people. In the uh, third pastoral letter, The Telling Takes Us Home, we'll find that uh, a number of things in terms of who we're speaking to and how we're speaking to those participants, how the process works, much of that has changed. So Pope Francis in these days says that listening is still very important. So wisdom, he says, comes from listening to the holy faithful people of God to listen with our hearts and then let's walk together. So there's been a lot of development over these past 50 years. If you recall, back in uh, the time when the first letter was promulgated, we were speaking about um, this land is home to me as a place from a life from this home. This land is home to me. This land means more to me than all the races and the places in the world around. This land of mountains and valleys and streams, this land is home to me. But people come and go, they don't seem to show a sign of love for the little things the mountains bring. This land of mountains and valleys and streams, this land is home to me. People hear me, what I say, my children left this land 
inspiration for the title of that original pastoral letter. But in 40 years, a number of things have changed, and how we frame the story here in Appalachia changes. So I'd like to bring us up to date with uh, a, a trailer for a film called The Magisterium of the People uh, that uh, was commissioned by the Catholic Committee of Appalachia. And this will give us a sense of the story in these days. If certain people admitted what was going on, they would either have a conscience problem or they'd have to give it up. In this community, these 97 families were not even being told they were being poisoned. There's no employment, there's no industry in the area, so when things go down, there's just no hope. They're starting in on that side, so these are all fresh cuts. We should look at what's happening here as the body of Christ. Why don't we just go forward with this plan of writing a pastoral letter that puts the people and their stories at the center? The question is, it like to be in this place? That was a key moment. And when I came across that, I thought, this is exactly what the church has to be in this area. We struck something in a lot of people that felt empowering to honor the authority of people and their ideas and their hopes and dreams for their lives. We all want, you know, we're all connected. And you begin to realize the connection is more. In this uh, film, you would have seen uh, a number of folks who are part of our presentation today. So Michael Iafrate, who was the lead author for the Tell Him Takes Us Home, will be joining us uh, later. Uh, Bishop John Stowe of Lexington is the ecclesial advisor for the Catholic Committee of uh, Appalachia in these days. And one of the women that you saw in the film, Beth Davies, was one of the original persons who took the committee around to various parts of Appalachia, listening to uh, the voices of people. <coughs> now, uh, what I would like to share with you now then is how they came up with that idea of magisterium of the people. And this is the, uh, this is the uh, director of that film, Sebastian Gomes, who currently works for uh, America Magazine. Whoops. I came across the story of the People's Pastoral from the Catholic Committee of Appalachia when I was doing research for the Francis Impact, another documentary premiering in 2019 from Salt and Light. Uh, and it was a group of people that had been very prophetic in the years after Vatican II, who had been a little bit marginalized from the institutional church over the last 20, 25 years, who with the arrival of Pope Francis 
have really been vindicated in the work that they were doing. Uh, and so I latched onto this story right away. When we filmed it, we and understood the complexities, especially the region of Appalachia, all the different factors, uh, we realized that this had to be its own film. So we made it its own film called The Magisterium of the People. Um, and it's a story, it's a Francis impact story, but more importantly, it's the story of this group uh, writing this people's pastoral letter uh, on the authority of the people who are voiceless in Appalachia, who, as we know, Jesus would have been closest to if he was around today. So I'd like to point out the significance of something that Mr. Gomes has said there, which is that uh, what we're doing here in Appalachia has significance not only for us, but also worldwide. That there's a connection between what Pope Francis is saying, what the Catholic Committee of Appalachia is saying, and as Mr. Gomes says, what Pope Francis is saying is a vindication of the voice of the people. Currently, I have up a picture of another speaker in that film, Bishop John Stowe of the Diocese of Lexington, who serves as the Episcopal Advisor for the Catholic Committee of Appalachia. He uh, says that we do not always understand or feel capable of talking about what it means to be vulnerable in these days, but we know more than ever, especially in this time of pandemic, that vulnerability is very important. And being able to speak about it and act in spite of it is very important. So now I would like to introduce our guest speaker, Michael Iafre. Michael is, is a double legal here at Wheeling University. He got his bachelor's degree in 1999 and also his master's in 2003. He's currently a PhD candidate. Uh, speaking about in his thesis, the decolonizing of Appalachian theology. So Michael, uh, if you would join us and tell us, bring us up to date with your involvement with CCA and also what the Catholic community of Appalachia is doing in these days. Michael? Great, hey, welcome, uh, or um, I'm happy to be with you all. Um, I'm a little bit flustered because uh, at 11.30 this morning, my uh, rural internet went down just as I was about to sign in here. Um, and so I had to gather my things and drive 25 minutes to another place where I could present comfortably. And the internet here is actually kind of in and out. So um, I'm actually in my nephew's bedroom. So thank you, Luca, to, for letting me invade your space for a little bit. And, and if this is an, an argument for um, rural broadband in West Virginia, I don't know what is, but I'm, again, really happy to be here. But Please bear with me as I'm kind of a little shaky from the experience this morning, but um, I have been involved with Catholic Committee of Appalachia for about 10 years now. Um, CCA about 10 years ago re reworked its mission statement and its current mission statement I think reflects what CCA has been about for its entire 50 year history and that is it's a faith based network raising a prophetic voice for Appalachia and her people. Very succinct and something that we can memorize really easily, but that's um, really the heart of what CCA is about. What I'd like to do is um, just touch on briefly on three things in the time that I have. First, my own encounter, uh, initial encounters with the, the Bishop's pastoral letter, the Appalachian pastoral letters, and with CCA. They didn't have, those encounters didn't happen at the same time. Um, and then I'd like to talk a little bit about what CCA is doing now, and then I'd like to make an invitation to, to all of you. So first of all, my first encounters with the, the Appalachian pastoral letters. Of course, um, I went to Wheeling Jesuit University. I first encountered those pastoral letters um, when I was an undergraduate student and I was studying theology. Um, Father Jim O'Brien would have been the one to introduce those pastoral letters to me as he has done with generations of students at Wheeling Jesuit University. Um, and you know, I was, I was interested in them, um, but my theological were kind of elsewhere. I was getting really excited as a 20-year-old, um, you know, about to think about my senior thesis and stuff. I was thinking about Latin American liberation theology and the church's social teaching. And this is what I focused on. And for some reason, um, the, the Appalachian pastoral letters didn't hit me at the right time at that time. I think part of it was that I'm from West Virginia 
And I kind of grew up like a lot of kids in West Virginia thinking that this place isn't all that special. You know, I just kind of, you know, was looking elsewhere for things. And so theologically, that's what I did too. I um, got very interested in, like I said, other forms of theology and stuff. Um, but, you know, I continued my work. I worked at Wheeling Jesuit for a few years as a campus minister and in a, and a parish in Morgantown and eventually discerned that I wanted to, to work on a doctorate in theology and study liberation theology. And I did that in, um, in Canada at the University of um, St. Michael's College in Toronto. And I, it was during my time when I was thinking about um, what I wanted to, to focus my dissertation on that I kind of revisited those Appalachian pastoral letters, probably in part out of a little bit of homesickness. Um, you know, it was the first time I'd lived away from home and I'm encountering people who are curious about this guy from West Virginia. And, you know, they have a lot of questions about what Appalachia is and stuff. So I pulled those letters out and I revisited them and wrote a, paper, a little paper about it and eventually started to think, um, you know, I, I want to focus my dissertation on this, but I really want to dig in to the, the role that liberation theology played in the development of those pastoral letters. And in doing so, I, um, I learned the story that Rich has recounted over these last sessions about how the Catholic Committee of Appalachia formed out of the Commission on Religion in Appalachia. And it was a network of um, sisters and priests and lay people, activists trying to um, you know, have some influence in the region. And then they you know, came up with the idea for the pastoral letter and that they were really the ones who uh, planned it and researched it and even wrote it. And then the bishops were the ones who signed it. And I, I thought that that process was really um, interesting because it really challenges the way we think about church teaching, that it's coming from the top down all the time. Whereas in, with CCA and the bishops of Appalachia, that theology was really coming from below. So not only did I learn that history of CCA, I discovered that CCA was actually still in existence. So about 10 years ago, when I was um, developing my um, my dissertation proposal, I, uh, I learned that CCA Well, we may have lost uh, Michael there. All right, uh, what I would like to, until Michael gets back to us, um, I would like to move on then and uh, introduce Robbie D'Andrade from the class of 1972. Robbie? Well, it's, it's good to see everyone. Mike, well, I hope you come on, come back on. And when you do come back on, we'll certainly have you finish. Uh, your comments have been extraordinarily uh, interesting. And thank you, Michael, and thank you for, for uh, uh, Father McCouch as well. I mean, look at all of us here, how fortunate we all are to be here on a computer. Michael might be on the phone right, right now but able to participate in a lecture series like this. I am really thinking that those in Appalachia, not only do they not have computers, many of them, they don't even have Wi-Fi, or don't, they don't even have the ability to travel 25 minutes to find a place to get on Wi-Fi. So we're, we're beyond uh, lucky to be able to participate on this today. And we're all joining from all over the place, probably all over the country, you know, where there's Washington, DC, Florida, New York, Pennsylvania, New York, we're all able to do that. And I'm also thinking that as all of us here, I would imagine that most of you, or probably most of you, have probably read the books Educated by Tara Westover. You probably read The Glass Castle by Jeanette Walls. You might have read Hillbilly Elegy by J.D. Vance. Now, when you think of that, you think, wow, those individuals, how extraordinarily do they overcome their poverty, their adversity, their lack of education, how they overcome a dysfunctional family. But that's an exception. That's not really reality. That's not what we're talking about today. That really does not seem to happen most of the time. And one of the things I wanted to share, about four years ago, my wife, Mary, and I, we traveled up to a Seattle University. We actually were in Seattle because our daughter was living there. And we always would go to Sunday Mass at the chapel. And it was very interesting. As we're sitting in Sunday Mass, you know, during the congregation, the president of the Student Government Association and Campus Ministry was speaking to the congregation. And guess what the topic was? The topic was they're going to be spending their spring break traveling to Wheeling, West Virginia, 2,500 miles away, and they were going to help with their time, their knowledge, 
their energy, their skills with their spring break community service program. Now, I have to admit, I remember back in 1970, 71, and 72, I traveled from Wheeling, West Virginia to Florida to go to the beach. These young adults, so there were, it was just amazing. So afterwards, my wife and I, we spent about five minutes, well, actually more than five minutes, so quite a few minutes, uh, talking to them. And we really were proud to hear, here we are 2,500 miles away, and we're here in Wheeling, West Virginia, a travel destination. I mean, come on now. But we were really proud that we heard that. So we spoke with them, and obviously one of the things they were asking for was you know, some contributions to help them in their travel and their trip. And we certainly uh, welcomed that, and we did help them and donate that. So some of the things I've been thinking about and reflecting, uh, some quotes that I think are very important and insightful. Mahatma Gandhi, one of the things he has said is the future depends on what we do in the present. I know that sounds very basic, but it's true. What we do today is gonna affect us in the future. Mother Teresa, one of the famous quotes that she has shared with a lot of us throughout the world is keep filling the ocean with drops of water and more. All of us here, we can do more. And as Father Mercasha also quoted Pope Francis, he said, listen with the heart. Let us walk together. Yes, let us walk together. And in thinking more about that, I'm challenging all of us here. We can walk together. We can walk together and we can donate our time. We could donate our knowledge. We could donate our experience. We could donate our energy, our prayers. Of course, we also could donate financially, but these are some of the things that we are able to do. Most of these things that we're talking about are just not even in the thought process of those in Appalachia. I'd like to just take a minute again to thank you, Father McCouch and the Appalachian Institute. Congratulate Michael and the CCA for their 50 years of service. I mean, that really is extraordinary. And the more we keep growing and dropping more water, the better all of us will become. So I'll turn it back over to you, Father McCouch. I think Michael might be back on. Michael, I hope, uh, sorry I superseded you, but if you are back on, why don't you continue with your discussion? Thank you. Okay, Michael, are you back with us? I am for the time being, so let's, I'll uh, do what I can. I apologize for the dropout there. I did change locations again, so hopefully it's a little better. I was talking about my first CCA gathering and how, um, I was really astounded by the um, by this community of faith that had persisted at the time for about 40 years and how they continued to gather year after year to, um, to think about the region and to rejuvenate one another, to reminisce a bit about the story of how the pastorals came together, but to think about the present and to think about the future. Um, they were and dedicated to dedicated to really to living out Vatican II in the Appalachian region. That's, that was really a central feature as well. Um, it, it was, to me, it brought the pastoral letters to life. You know, the, the pastoral letters are amazing documents, but once you know the story of how they developed and how it was part of this dynamic community of faith and people at all levels of the church, bishops and priests and sisters and lay people all working together to, um, to create a vision statement together that became that pastoral letter, um, once I met those people at the CCA gathering, that became just really alive to me. I met people like uh, Sister Beth Davies, who is still with us. She's, she and Father Les Schmidt were the two people who drove around the region in a little car with notebooks and tape recorders to listen to the stories of the people. Um, and Father Les and Sister Beth are still with us. I met Maureen Linneman, who wrote the, the song, This Land is Home to Me. And I love telling the story that a bishop's pastoral letter was named after a folk song written by a feminist former nun. I just love that aspect of that pastoral letter. And th these are the things that you learn when you become part of the community of what CCA is about beyond just reading the pastoral letters. So to me, that was really exciting. I also learned about, you know, deeper history that um, and Wheeling Jesuit University's connection with CCA. Father Joe Hakala, of course, was uh, an active member of CCA for much of his uh, life. And really the Appalachian Institute probably wouldn't exist without his deep involvement within the CCA network and all that that represented. And people like Jim O'Brien and Joe Sanders as well. So I have to mention them. Um, 
again, it's uh, people refer to them as the Appalachian bishops pastoral letters, and that's true in a sense, and we we do want to celebrate that. But the more I learned about it, the the more uncomfortable I am calling them bishops pastorals because they really are pastorals from the people, and I th I think that's what's what was so um, invigorating for me and and my faith and my work. So I got quickly involved in CCA. I joined the board. Um, we started to see more young people come on board on CCA, people that were just starting their careers in the region, people who serve at places like Bethlehem Farm and Nazareth Farm and other, other sorts of ministries throughout the region. And they started to become, they started to learn about CCA too and to become attracted to this space where we could learn from one, from one another intergenerationally. You know, that um, we come together across generations and across the places where we are to learn about what works and what doesn't work and what what's your what's your experience been with the people and here's what my experience has been and so that was really exciting to see and of course um the more i got involved people and 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 the year 2015 started to approach cca really started to um to ask that question should we be doing a third pastoral letter on the next 20th anniversary and the sense was that yes there's so much more to say about appalachia mountaintop removal is so much more devastating for example we now have the reality of the oil and gas industry um, the voices of uh, lgbt people in appalachia and people of color of App in appalachia are much more are much stronger and more visible and we have things to say and things to pay attention to that were not covered <clears throat> in those letters but the but the reality hit us also that the bishops of the region were not likely to sign something that CCA would want to develop in a pastoral letter. Um, as many of us know, the, the pastoral priorities of our bishops in this country has shifted over the last 20 years or more, and um, social justice is not always at the forefront of the brains of the bishops. So what we decided to do for this pastoral letter, and this film, Magisterium of the People, talks about this very well, is that we went back to that original insight of this land is home to me, that the important thing about this letter is not that the bishop signed it, but that it is the voice of the people coming from the bottom and um, being lifted up. And so whether we could get bishops to be involved or not, or a, this or that diocese to be enthusiastic about our project didn't matter because what we wanted to do was to continue to be the church of the people and the church of the poor and to lift those voices up. Hey, we might have lost Michael again. Um, Phil, would you like to uh, spend a moment uh, inviting conversation and discussion? Let me get back on here. Yes, uh, yes, Father. Thank you. Want to? I want to thank you, Father, and and Robbie and Michael. Uh, we as alumni can uh, certainly relate to uh, some of. Uh, Michael's comments, particularly about uh, Jesuits, we remember and reflect on wonderful memories we have with uh, Jim O'Brien and, and and Joe Sanders, two uh, two people that were very involved in CCA and in the pastoral letters. So I, I would, with that, I would like to uh, I would like to uh, ask if uh, President Favid would like to uh, comment before we open the mics uh, for our alumni. I'm not sure that she's on at the moment. Oh no, I'm still here, Father. I'm still here. Okay, thank you. I, uh, I don't know about all of you, but what Mr. Iafray is sharing is riveting. Um, I and, and Robbie, I have read those books. Um, I read Glass Castles actually twice. Uh, it was required reading with both of my kids as they went through high school. Um, and she's fascinating. Um, I actually read Hillbilly Elegy uh, recently. I actually still have the book um, in, in my bookshelf and, and, and it's amazing. Uh, all I can say is, you know, again, I appreciate um, that you all have worked to bring this before us. Um, I, I, you know, the, the one thing I, I will note is it's clear um michael i'm glad you're back um is that it, as michael is explaining is that our work is not done yet um uh, i'm gonna stop because before you got back on i said this was absolutely riveting for me and i was hanging on to your every word so i would rather listen to you than to myself 
and I'm so sorry about the the dropouts, but it seems like they've occurred in the three parts that I want to cover. So we're good, I think. Um, uh, yeah, I was just saying, CCA continues by um, being being the church we want to see in the world. We don't ask permission from church leaders. We try to do it ourselves, if I can use a punk rock term, do it yourself, right? Um, we try to be a group that advocates for Appalachian people, for the land, and for Appalachian issues. We also look at, um, we're also very active in church reform. CCA had an insight early on that the church needs to look different in this region. It can't be like the church everywhere else. And a lot of people across the world have that insight too. So we've raised what we think is a prophetic voice um, for church reform. And uh, currently, I mean, I think one of the main things we all agree has been on our minds is the, um, the need for church reform in our diocese around um, the, the Bishop Bransfield scandal. And so CCA has been a strong voice around that issue too, expressing dissatisfaction with the way that's been handled. Um, we, we have state chapters in all of the Appalachian states, which are active in various ways on the ground. Um, we do educational efforts like the, um, our annual gathering, which is actually taking place right now for the first time online. Of course, we gather in person. That's real important to us. But right uh, this year, of course, we decided to do a virtual annual gathering, which began uh, the weekend of September 11th. And we decided to stretch that out over the course of a month. So the weekend of September 11th, we enjoyed a couple of keynote um, this, uh, keynote addresses by Bill McKibben, somebody you may have heard of, and a theologian named Ched Myers, and we celebrated lit liturgy virtually together. And we're continuing with a series of workshops through October 11th. We had a really great one last night online about the LGBT community in Appalachia, which was really incredible, really inspiring. Um, this Friday, I'd like to invite you to um, our the next workshop, which is a viewing of that film, Magisterium of the People. We'll do that online, followed by a panel discussion with nine of our senior members, our wisdom figures, who will talk more and get, get into those stories about how those pastoral letters developed and what they think the, that CCA should be doing into the future. And we'll, they'll be joined as well by some voices from our younger members as well. Um, the way you access that will be on a slide that I think Rich is gonna put up in a little bit, um, but there's some instructions that go along with that. But I wanna make sure that you all feel welcome to join us for that workshop or for any of the other upcoming workshops that you can find on our website. And there are registration instructions there. Um, another, another thing we do is speak with immersion groups. I've spoken to a lot of the groups that come through the Appalachian Institute and that's always a treat. Um, and we collaborate at, in terms of activism with secular groups and other Catholic groups. Uh, including Salt and Light Media being one of the Catholic groups. They're the group that made the, um, the Magisterium of the, of the People film, and that was a real treat to be part of that film. So um, in addition, well, just uh, in closing, uh, in addition to inviting you to that film, I would like to invite you to check out our website, ccappal.org, um, because what, what you can find there is what CCA is about in a little bit more in-depth way. You can uh, read all three pastoral letters. They're there for free. You can also become a member of CCA. So if, if this series of sessions from Father Rich has kind of sparked your interest in the pastorals maybe for the first time or rekindled your interest in them from years past, we want to stress that CCA continues to be that context where the action plans, you know, that Father Alf Rich talked about, um, where we can kind of hatch those action plans and discover what is the spirit calling us to do today. CCA is a great context for that because whether we're working <laughs> with the Appalachian Institute or in a Catholic worker house or as a theologian or a sister working with people in the coal fields, we can all come together and learn from each other and compare notes, so to speak, and to, and to learn more about this region that we love um, in a way that's dynamic and responding to the times that we live in. Very much like Pope Francis, and I like how Rich keeps tying in Pope Francis throughout this series. CCA has been doing, I think, what Pope Francis is about for 50 years. And um, it is really liberating to see, as Sebastian Gomes put it in the video you watched, how vindicating that is for a group like CCA, who hasn't always, CCA's voice hasn't always been welcomed by other church entities. And so to see somebody like Pope Francis really um, embodying what we're about, it it's a real shot in the arm, so to speak. So we invite you to join us.
uh, and or to keep doing whatever you're doing for the people of Appalachia and for the region and to keep letting the pastoral letters uh, all three of them inspire you and your work and to connect with others and to take um, to take each other's stories seriously as we create a new world where we live so thank you very much I'm glad I got through some, <laughs> through some more of that thank you so much thank you Michael thank you thank you uh, uh, the thank you Michael for instructions on how to join that website are on the study guide that Alicia sent around uh, yesterday afternoon. So Phil, I'll turn it back over to you for what limited time we have left uh, regarding response. I, th I think uh, today's uh, series and lecture, Father, has, uh, has given us some greater insight into Appalachia. Uh, Michael's persistence in uh, staying with us all through this uh, this effort and his his efforts to uh, stay online with us there in uh, in the area I think is indicative of uh, areas that we need to uh, we need to address in Appalachia I would I would like to open it now to the, the alumni who are on uh, with us today and if we could open our mics and uh, see if we can get some some discussion questions uh, we would ask you either to raise your hand through the computer or send your question in a chat message using the chat board. Uh, and maybe there are some questions on the chat board already we might be able to address. Uh, so, Jared, uh, are you there to assist us uh, with that chat board? With us, he's at another location. Okay. So, uh, do we have any? Uh, Anyone that wants to address a question or uh, just raise a hand if I, uh, yes. Uh, Dan. Uh, I wanted to follow up on uh, what uh, Robbie invited us to do. And the question is how uh, could we be effective? And my suggestion is that um, we do everything we can to support uh, Wheeling Jesuit not only with uh, uh, funds but also with ideas because of Wheeling University but I'm hoping that uh, someday it'll be uh, Wheeling Jesuit I'd like to see more Jesuits back in the classroom to that effect I've written a letter to uh, uh, Bishop Brennan recently but um, it's I mean what we're talking about and what we're seeing is the effect that uh, Wheeling Jesuit has had uh, in the past uh, with Fathers O'Brien, Sanders, Hakala, and Michael's uh, input, and his background comes from from the university. So I think because we all live in um, a distance from from Wheeling, but we can be um, contributors to what's happening and what will happen in Appalachia by supporting a university that focuses on the issues uh, that uh, the people of Appalachia are experiencing and need to be addressed. So that is my comment. Do we have any other comments or, Ed? Yeah, I'm Phil, Ed Shaheen. Well, wait, Paula Feld is raising her hand. Let her, let her speak. Oh. Just a quick comment. Um, you know, Robbie mentioned three excellent books that I've read, but to even get more insight into Appalachia, I would recommend uh, What You're Getting Wrong About Appalachia is the title, and it's by Elizabeth Catt, C A T T E. She actually um, gives acknowledgement to Father Hakala, you know, for her, his work. And she worked with him a lot with the Appalachian Institute, but she kind of um, she's responding a little bit to hillbilly elegy and that author's view of Appalachia. So I think it's really worth reading. It's a very short book, but it, it, it's, it's an eye opener. That's it. <laughs> thank you, Paula. Ed, I think you had a comment. Yes, thank you. My, my comments about how to use healthcare is an entree into addressing the issues in Appalachia. And I think it's already done somewhat through the Appalachian Institute. But I gave an address uh, to the university 
a little bit over a year ago and made that request. We've had since, you know, change of administration and the epidemic, but Jenny, I'm, I'm going to make the request again, and you've heard it from me, that we try to make, to get our healthcare students more involved in Appalachia. I was at the University of North Carolina for 20 years, and we, because we had all the schools together, medical school, nursing school, nurse practitioner school, they all did rotations within Appalachia, and their faculty did rotations. And they not only deliver health care, I think they help with the political issues. And I think if you read Hillbilly Elegy, which many of you quoted on, although I think that author is an attorney, he mentioned the health care issue. So maybe even uh, Father McCouch, you might consider health care as one of our themes for a future discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. Any other comments? Do we have, uh, I see any other hands raised here? Thank you all. Well, this is Rob. I'm just going to make one other comment. Michael, thank you so much again for your persistence and going forward. Your message was just uh, uh, amazing. And thank you again for everything that you and, and all of uh, the group does uh, at CCA. So thank you again. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. And I think we're going to have uh, a uh, a slide on this uh, uh, Friday event. Michael, you said you were going to provide us something. Maybe we could do that through our email uh, out to our alumni for the uh, Friday, the Magisterium of, of the People. I think we can do that, uh, Phil. It's also, the information is included on the study guide that was sent out yesterday to everybody. But it could be it could be repeated in an email today. Very good. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a wonderful, wonderful event. Father, if there's no more comments, I think we're right on right on time here. So uh, would you please uh, 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 close in a prayer? I will. Looks like Ginny might have a comment or question. If oh, uh, she's raising her, hand. her hands up, thank you. I don't want to ignore her. Michael, this is actually directed to you. I just I want to thank you um, for for sharing your journey of of being a young man here, of Father O'Brien's um, influence on you that that erupted later. Um, your your story, your journey is touching and inspirational, um, and the fact that you've dedicated your life to that um, is very meaningful. I would like to personally invite you um, to help me um, continue that work here. Um, I would like to see you get more involved. I have, you know, a, a whole generation of students um, that need to have that opportunity to be affected today. Um, I'm, you know, I'm profoundly um, moved by what you shared. And, and I agree with you, just the fact that your internet kept failing is, is a representation of the still lacking environment that we have in Appalachia. Um, so I, you know, I wanted to uh, to see, you know, if through Father um, McCouch and and Tom Brighting, if even if we could at, at a minimum um, show the films here to our students, you know, we're being very um, um, you know, uh, creative. We're actually doing outdoor movies for our students right now um, with COVID and everything. But I think it's an opportunity, um, and and I and I think that I would love to see you involved in sharing your knowledge and your passion. And so um, in, in closing, I just want to say thank you for your leadership. It is very much appreciated. Thank you. I appreciate it and happy to talk more for sure. Thank you, thank thank you. you for yours. Thank you, thank you President Fahid. And I think that uh, Michael has is, is certainly brought forward a, uh, a history lesson for us, for our Jesuits, when we think about Father Sanders, Father uh, Jim O'Brien, Father Hakala. Uh, I was there in 1964 to 68, they were there. And uh, they they have continued a history right through to Father Hadi and Father uh, McCouch and Father O'Donnell. And I think this is this is why we need, as Dan has, has, has emphasized, we need to bring uh, a full contingent of Jesuits back to our university as, as soon as we can. And uh, I think this uh, is, is emphasis to that fact. Thank you very much. Father, would you please uh, close in a prayer? I will. I'll just make a quick pitch for our next presentation on October 22nd. And then uh, here's our closing prayer. 
So, Lord, in this month when we celebrate creation, we thank you for our church and the Catholic community of Catholic Committee of Appalachia. We thank you for our university. We thank you for the care of our students and alumni past and present. We thank you for our mentors, for our teachers, our administrators. We thank you for our benefactors and for our dependents. And we thank you, Lord, for Appalachia in all of its people. We thank you, Lord, who are our true home. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you all. And uh, we will be looking for our fourth uh, and final, you know, but they, maybe we will continue. Who knows? Uh, on the October, the fourth Thursday in October, right now, the 22nd of October. So please plan, put that on your calendar, and uh, we will see you then. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, President Fahid. Thank you, Father McCouch, Michael, uh, uh, Michael, and uh, and all that uh, supported today, and Robbie and uh, Ed and uh, Dan and all of the alumni out there. Thank you very much. And please, uh, is these is these uh, as these uh, uh, sessions or put up on, on the web, please uh, let your classmates know, okay? And uh, let them, let them uh, view these. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a lovely day. Stay safe, everyone. Thanks, everybody.